The next lecture uh, this afternoon is on the minimum wage. And uh, a lot of people think that they know about the minimum wage. They've worked for the minimum wage. They've seen the supply and demand graph. They know minimum wage causes unemployment. But that's not the whole story. And there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of debate about the minimum wage. And economists seem to be not of one mind on this topic. So there's a lot of people who didn't show up today because they thought that they knew all the stuff that you're going to know. And they're going to pay. <laughs> Yeah. The other lecture is Theory and History by David Gordon. They are going to pay. <laughs> okay. And this was a topic in the original Mises universities uh, that were organized uh, by Murray Rothbard himself. We go through two days of all the methodology lectures that you've seen already, and at the end of the second day, the example uh, that leads from the methodology and theory was a sub a subject to a lecture on the minimum wage itself. So this is something that we don't cast off. This is a, this is a great example. It's a classic example of economic analysis, and we're going to see in here why there's confusion and why there's debate. Uh, it's, and it's because people don't understand in depth what the minimum wage does. Uh, in addition to minimum wage, there's a lot of topics, uh, legislation out there about having a living wage in certain countries and uh, certain cities and so forth. Equal pay for equal work is always in the news, and a lot of that stuff is on the ballot. We've seen uh, many uh, minimum wage ballot measures in the last several years on the city and county level, um, but it's sort of been taken off the table since 2009 <clears throat> at the national level. So we're going to deal with the confusion, and we're going to provide the Austrian approach to the minimum wage, which will really clarify things in our thinking. Okay, so what is the minimum wage? Well, it's simply a floor, a legal floor on how much labor can be paid on an hourly basis. So currently, the federal minimum wage says that employers cannot pay less uh, in their paychecks than lower than uh, $7.25 an hour. So it prevents people from making contracts below that specified level, even though both parties to the contract may think they're going to benefit from it. You can, of course, pay much higher wages, uh, but you can't pay lower. Uh, 31 states have minimum wage laws that are higher than the federal law. The state of Alabama doesn't even have a minimum wage law, so we're stuck with the federal law. And I think there's four or five states that simply do not have it. And then again, recently, cities mostly on the West Coast uh, have adopted much higher minimum wage laws. In Seattle, it's eventually going to go up to $15 an hour. Okay, so this is the conventional analysis. So you've got a demand for labor. What employers are willing to pay for workers. The demand for labor is basically how much productivity labor or additional labor can provide a company. So they're looking at it Purely in a market situation, employers are looking at how much to hire based on the productivity of labor. So other considerations are very uh, little or none at all uh, in the minds of employers. They don't really care. The supply of labor is what you and I are willing to provide at different wages. So at a wage of $1... There's not going to be very, very little labor forthcoming, but if you go to the equilibrium level here, you're going to get a greater quantity of labor into the market. Uh, and if you set a minimum wage law above equilibrium 
so that it's an effective legal decree, the quantity of labor supplied is going to increase to a very high level. And we're talking about here uh, low-skilled labor. We used to call it unskilled labor, but in the era of political correctness, people have been taking exception to that, that, you know, if you're working at a minimum wage job and somebody calls you unskilled, um, it's a little, it is a little insulting. So, but at this high wage, this high minimum wage, uh, employers only find it profitable to hire a very small quantity of labor. So this is the straightforward price theory approach that you see in mainstream textbooks. This actually leaves out quite a bit. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Herbener said on the opening day, or the Monday, that uh, he was talking about price theory and, and how economists agree that price theory is important. Even Milton Friedman wrote a price theory textbook, and it's sort of the bread and butter of economic analysis. Prices are the most motivating uh, factor within a market economy, but that's assuming a, a great deal about all other factors other than price. And we see this come alive in the war on drugs, and we're going to see this come alive with a minimum wage. But you can bet that all sorts of government interventions are going to ha have price effects, but they're going to have other effects as well. And in this case, they can be very important. And this will help clarify our analysis of what the minimum wage law does. Okay, so in this dispute, in this confusion within professional academic economists, we have some people, such as this person, who says, there's just no evidence that raising the minimum wage costs jobs, at least when the starting point is as low as it is in modern America. This apparent defiance of the laws of supply and demand occurs because, quote, the market for labor isn't like the market for, say, wheat, because workers are people. <laughs> now, on the other hand, <clears throat> we have important mainstream economists who believe pretty much the exact opposite. Any Econ 101 student can tell you the answer, the higher wage reduces the quantity of labor demanded and hence leads to unemployment. Clearly, these advocates of the minimum wage law very much, very much want to believe that the price of labor, unlike the price of gasoline or Manhattan apartments, can be set based on considerations of justice, not supply and demand without unpleasant side effects. Okay, so the first person that I quote is this person. That's Paul Krugman, former professor of economics at Princeton University, an elite institution, editorial writer for the New York Times, and Nobel Prize winning economist. Okay? So it may seem silly, but some people must believe in him. Now, the other quote, which seemed to be the exact opposite, you can probably imagine who said this. Oh, <laughs> it was Paul Krugman, too. So even within the same person, there's a great deal of confusion here, <laughs> as there always is with Paul. Okay, so recently the Seattle thing has been in the news because they're taking the minimum wage up eventually to $15 an hour. And there were two important uh, studies done, one by the University of California, Berkeley, which is tends to be left-leaning. Uh, I think the city council asked for this study, and then the mayor asked for this study from the University of Washington, which is a little more centrist. And the city council paid for one, and the mayor paid for the other. So in the Berkeley study, they very much wanted to downplay the adverse effects of the minimum wage. As a matter of fact, the economists on this team have done a lot of work, a lot of sophisticated work, um, 
to try to measure the effect of the minimum wage by overcoming the problem of ceteris paribus or ceteris paribus. They looked at only the food service industry. The increases in wages were from anywhere from 11 to $13. They saw little or no change in pay, wage pay, and employment in full service restaurants. Okay, so this is where you're getting full service. You don't go to the counter. You get led to your table, and there's tablecloths, and a waiter comes out, takes your order, delivers your food, fills your water glass, and so forth. Limited service increases less than expected by 4%. Okay, so they, they were thinking it was going to increase it by 18%, but in fast food restaurants, the increase was only 4%. And what they did find was that hours work declined by 13%. They didn't really find much unemployment in terms of people losing their job. But when you looked at the food industry as a whole, the number of hours worked decreased. So our graph, in a sense, wouldn't capture that because the number of people didn't change that much. But the number of hours that they worked fell by less than their increase in wage rate. University of Washington wanted to show that the minimum wage did have an effect, negative effect on labor. So they looked at not just food service, but all industries with low wage workers. So they expanded their reach, in other words. And what they found was that it reduced the number of hours worked by 9% and only increased wages by 3%. So you're taking a global look at firms here so that the increase in the minimum wage for the entire firm only ended up increasing wage rates within the firm by 3%, uh, but the number of hours worked fell by 9%. So the monthly pay was actually reduced. And they found that high-skilled workers earning $19 or more an hour, actually those jobs increased. So what was going on in, in these firms was that they would be reducing the number of hours to the low-skilled workers and hiring high-skilled workers uh, to take up the slack. So you can get a high-skilled a high chef or cook, for example, and get more of them involved in the process in reducing the number of uh, water boys and you know people clearing dishes and that sort of thing. So you have... One group trying to minimize the effect and one group trying to maximize the effect. Um, but both of these studies basically say the same thing. Okay, that the effect of the increase in the minimum wage did not really necessarily reduce the number of jobs within firms, at least initially. This is a short-run effect, not a long-run effect. This is a short-run effect. So the increases in wages or the price of labor decreased the number of hours uh, rather than the number of jobs and reduced monthly pay. So the workers here probably wouldn't uh, think this is a good thing. They might have to work an extra job to make up for the difference. Uh, both studies found a relative substitution of high-skilled for low-skilled jobs. So the people just entering the workforce uh, there were fewer jobs available for them, but people with higher skills um, went up in number. And eventually, when we go from the short run to the long run, we'll not only see more high-skilled workers and fewer low-skilled workers, but we'll also see more capital replacement. Like McDonald's right now is responding to these higher minimum wages by installing kiosks in their restaurants. Once you buy the kiosk, it's basically going to be there at the counter taking orders forever and ever, and there's very little ongoing expense um, to having the kiosk there. So once you buy it, it's going to last for maybe a decade. And eventually those kiosks will be replaced by even better kiosks. Uh, and it's worthy to note that even though the effects were relatively mild in the short run, remember, mild in the short run, Seattle is a bubble city. 
That's where Boeing is located, Microsoft is located, Amazon is located, and Nordstrom's. So they have four very high-end, large corporations uh, that have high-skilled workers. Uh, they're all headquartered right there in Seattle. And uh, the last time I checked, Seattle had more construction cranes. You know, the construction cranes you see around town? That's a very new phenomenon. I've been in Auburn now for 36 years, and the first one of those type of large cranes didn't show up until about 2015. There were more construction cranes in Seattle than in New York City and Los Angeles combined. So that's, and Seattle is a relatively small city. So um, you wouldn't expect, uh, you, in other words, you, you would most expect people in Seattle to be willing to not notice small increases in prices. Okay, so the Austrian perspective, I'm sort of introducing it a little bit of, at a time here. The minimum wage law causes some combination of the following effects. One is unemployment. This comes in the form of fewer hours, fewer jobs, and fewer employers, especially small business. One of the things that if you follow the news out of Seattle uh, and San Francisco and some of the other areas where they've increased the minimum wage, some of the classic mom-and-pop restaurants um, – that have been around and people consider them, you know, institutions in their community have had to close their doors because of hot requirements for higher pay, uh, health insurance, uh, those sorts of things. The employer tries to adjust, uh, but ultimately it's very difficult for small traditional mom and pop businesses to adjust. It's much easier for something like McDonald's that has research and development departments and strategy departments um, to make those adjustments. And they have the capital uh, to do things like go out and buy a million kiosks. Uh, the second thing is decreased job benefits. So there's many margins on which uh, business owners and to a lesser extent their employees can adjust to a higher minimum wage. And none of it's very good. For example... At the high end, health insurance, which is not really an option at many uh, mom and pops or even fast food restaurants, uh, but for example, uh, Waffle House provides or offers health insurance to its employees, but when the minimum wage goes up, the, uh, you know, the cost of health insurance is just too great and nobody opts for it. Uh, vacation in six days, and then little things like who pays for uniforms, who pays to have uniforms cleaned. Uh, there are mo many, many multiple things that employers can adjust. You know, if there was an increase in the minimum wage here in Alabama and Jeff had to raise my salary in, in, in response to that, uh, he might end up turning down the air conditioning or, you know, having a, a lower quality toilet paper purchased. Uh, there, there's all sorts of things that might be done. And you got to be, a, you have to be an, an entrepreneur, a business owner to know all those margins because every business owner is always looking at those margins or having other people look at those margins for them. Jeff doesn't actually make the purchasing decisions on toilet paper. Decrease job desirability. Okay, this is where some of these other things come into play. For example, make you work harder. For example, instead of an eight-hour shift at a restaurant where you have plenty of time in between lunch and dinner doing odds and ends, uh, maybe the employer will only have you work from, say, 11 to 2, and then other people come in from 5 to 8. So you've got to go back and forth. You've got to transport yourself twice in order to accumulate the same number of hours, less desirable. Uh, less sanitary conditions. Um, I worked in a hospital cafeteria. 
uh, when I was in high school, and there was a big increase in the minimum wage, which everybody was rejoicing over, uh, but the uh, janitor, his, uh, his job went from a full-time job to a part-time job, um, and, and so it was a high school student that came in the afternoon to do the janitorial work, and then the night crew actually finished the janitorial work, and the full-time with benefits person uh, ended up being replaced. And then, you know, little things like lighting, air conditioning, heating, etc. All those margins can be adjusted. And none of it is in really in the favor of the workers. Then there's an increase in the demand for high-skilled labor, as we saw in the restaurant studies. And some jobs are automated with capital, either partially or completely. This is something that employers are always doing. They're always automating things or adding capital to make workers more productive. It's just that when you see or you anticipate increases in the minimum wage, you see a flurry of these developments. Uh, one of the really nasty things about the minimum wage is that it causes discrimination. Remember earlier, I said that the demand for labor was based on how much labor could produce, how productive it was, how much could be produced, and what could we sell it for. So it's a hard-nosed accounting exercise by employers as to how much to hire. But with a higher minimum wage, you have an uncompetitive situation. Basically, you have more people willing to work at the minimum wage than there are jobs. So now employers get to pick labor from a large pool of workers. It's not like cutting edge supply and demand uh, competitive situation. So employers can now service their tastes for discrimination. I tell my students, um, something with respect to rent control, which is also a classic example of economic analysis. In rent control, the prices are held down rather than being held up. And in holding down the prices, there's not enough housing for everybody. And so I tell my students, uh, I select one student, I say, you've got an apartment, but instead of $650 renting it, you have to rent it for $200 or less because of rent control. And then I asked the class, I said, who do you think is in this room? Everybody in this room, who do you think, and we all want apartments, who do you think is going to get that apartment? We know in advance who's going to get the apartment. Does anybody know? A friend of the owner? No, me. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get the apartment. Or else. <laughs> okay, so this is from 2017, second quarter unemployment statistics. Total unemployment was 4.2%. So if we looked at the entire labor force, the unemployment rate was 4.2%. It's about 4% right now. For teenagers, the unemployment rate was 16.4%. So teenagers are the lowest skilled workers within the labor force. Uh, and so they get shut out of the decision process. They get shut out of jobs. And if we break down teenage unemployment, white teens have an unemployment rate of 14.7. Black teens, same age, 27.8. That's actually come down significantly this year. But there's still a difference here. There's a difference between teens and everybody, and there's a difference between black and white teens. And economists have long speculated that the reason for higher rates for teens than on average is because of the minimum wage law. 
You'd rather have, an employer would rather have a, a, a more skilled, more experienced, somebody who's interested in a job long term uh, than somebody who's going to come and go, uh, doesn't have the skills, is going to need to be trained, and then next year somebody else is going to have to be trained. So they exercise discrimination here between adults and teens, and then there's also discrimination shows up between white and black and Hispanic teens as well. So a lot of, dis a lot of discrimination in the economy is a result of these kind of interventions, such as the minimum wage law. Okay, now this uh, slide looks at employment in the European Union from 2004 to 2012. And what it looks at is the blue line is the unemployment rate in countries without a minimum wage. And the red line is the unemployment rate in countries with a minimum wage. So this is kind of a natural experiment, so to speak, where we divide Europe into the countries with a minimum wage and without a minimum wage. And it's worth noting that in countries and states without minimum wages, th things do, are not catastrophic. And actually, in the long run, it works out better. So as we're in the, the bubble, the unemployment rates are falling and the states with minimum wages is actually getting a little closer to the countries without the minimum wage. But then when the crisis hits, the unemployment rate in countries with the minimum wage actually expands enormously from about six and a quarter percent up to 12 percent. And in some of the countries with a more binding minimum wage, we see unemployment rates much higher than that and teenage unemployment 25, 30 percent. In contrast to that with countries where you can set your own wage, the unemployment is lower and has less of a negative reaction to the crisis in the, in the European economy after 2008. Here's another little piece of evidence. Teen employment and last hike in the minimum wage law, which was in 2009. So we haven't had an increase in the minimum wage law in the United States in nine years. But this is the economic crisis, January 08. That's basically begins in late 07, but was relatively insignificant until 2008. And so employment at the beginning of the study was about an index of 111. Uh, and employment decreases throughout. You get to July of 09, the final month of the previous minimum wage. So it was 655 and then it was bumped up to 725 an hour. So basically you have a decline here of about 10% over 18 months. So a 10% decline in the crisis over 18 months. And then when the new minimum wage kicks in here in July of 09, you get a decrease of almost, well, it was about uh, 8% within a matter of three months. So that had a significant deterrent to employment when the minimum wage increased. Okay, so the conclusions here, wage rates determined under market conditions, the relative scarcity of human and non-human resources determine wage rates. There is no unemployment in a pure market economy. We didn't cover that, but that's basically a conclusion that Austrians have been drawing that if we don't have intervention in the market economy, then everyone would always be able to get a job somewhere at some wage rate. And that's important because uh, if teenagers can get jobs, um, which right now it's, it's very difficult to do that in Europe and in the United States, uh, they get job experience. And you th you're thinking, well, did, is Thornton really using those janitorial skills um, or the dishwashing skills that he learned in the hospital cafeteria? Well, no, I'm not. But it teaches you things like how to behave at work, 
showing up for work on time, uh, being responsive to your boss, uh, doing uh, good deeds for the consumers, um, and being on your best behavior. Those things are things that will serve you well throughout your professional career, no matter what it is. Wage rate increases are driven by increases in capital and savings and the extension and expansion of the structure of production. In other words, the people who advocate the minimum wage, the living wage, equal pay for equal work, have no idea of what wage rates are based on and how to increase them. The Austrians have done a lot of good work on showing that in economies that are progressing, it's savings which gets turned into capital goods by entrepreneurs as well as new technologies, which makes workers more productive and ends up increasing wage rates. So the very first thing we need to know is not what the wage rate should be, but how do we get into a situation where wage rates are increasing, where the number of jobs are increasing rather than the opposite. And as I mentioned just previous, early job experience improves lifetime employment. So the fact that you have jobs as you're a young person and in high school and you're familiarizing yourself with the basic demands of work and pay, uh, those are skills that are going to do you well throughout your professional career. The people who don't get those jobs as teenagers and as young people, those people very often fall into the welfare trap, and they never really fully get in integrated into the market economy, and as a result tend to be uh, problematic uh, for society in the sense of having to support them uh, on welfare or in prisons, uh, things of that nature. And the most basic thing that we can conclude from the minimum wage, when you look at the, some of the facts that I've listed, is that the minimum wage actually hurts those it was intended to help. So those fast food workers who lost hours were displaced by the high-skilled workers in those same restaurants. So the high-skilled worker who's already making a decent salary, they're benefited at the expense of the people who lost hours or didn't have jobs available uh, to them at all. So how do we help the poor? We have to know what causes wage rates, and we have to know what raises wage rates. But in a more general sense, in order to help the poor, there's a lot of things that we can do. Number one is eliminate the minimum wage and compulsory education. There's a lot of ways you can downplay compulsory education, but especially if you're in a lousy public school, it would probably be much better for you to start getting jobs and work experience because job experience leads to higher wages down the road. Um, Three, eliminate monopoly grants by the government. Monopoly grants uh, and unions tend to restrict employment opportunities in all sorts of fields, and ultimately some people get left uh, in a very negative situation. We want to lower the cost of living and increase opportunity. And monopoly grants raise the cost of living and reduce opportunity. So eliminating monopoly grants by governments improves the situation of poor people immediately. So there's all sorts of profession, there's all sorts of industries where the government gives monopoly privileges by requiring licenses, um, giving away patents, uh, creating government jobs, all sorts of things that the government does, which grants monopolies, which increase the cost of living and decrease opportunity. Number five, eliminate taxes on labor. Okay? Every time we raise taxes 
on labor, we reduce the net uh, pay, basically, of workers. So the income tax, Social Security taxes, unemployment taxes, there's all sorts of things that get taken out of our paychecks, uh, which makes the poor worse off. It makes everybody worse off, but especially the poor. Encourage higher wages and income uh, and creating more jobs by eliminating taxes on labor. And then finally, eliminate the welfare trap. The welfare trap, uh, the, for the people who don't get the minimum wage because they can't find a job, they end up on welfare. So the government is giving them food stamps, uh, income support, public housing, all sorts of things. Uh, and if they were to go out and get a job and earn some money, the government would just simply take away the money on the other side. So I was talking to somebody just yesterday, um, and one of his relatives was in the Marines, and when he got out, he was in a car accident, and he ended up being a paraplegic. And he was on welfare as a result of that. Uh, but somehow or another, and I don't know how he could do this, but he found ways of making money. Uh, he had three different jobs, one of which was selling real estate. But if he reported his real estate commissions, they would have taken away his housing support. So in some sense, it's hard to feel too negative about people on welfare because they're caught in a trap. And many people find it rational not to do anything and collect the welfare benefits or work in the underground economy, um, work in the black market, and that sort of thing, because welfare is an awful, pernicious trap uh, for people since at least 1965. Okay, I'm just going to finish up here with a couple of things uh, that need to be said about misconception regarding labor. A lot of these advocates for changes in wage policy, um, they believe that employers determine wage rates and working conditions. It's a one-sided affair. The, the employer sets the wage and that's it. Well, now, I know for certain that when I was working at Auburn University, if the president of the university or the dean of business had the say-so as to how much I got paid, he might pay me minimum wage. And when you're only working nine hours a week, uh, that means my pay would be dramatically cut. If I was making the decision as to how much I was getting paid, well, you can imagine. <laughs> it's not employers, it's not employees. No single person determines wage rates in professions in the market economy. Uh, people still have the idea of the Malthusian trap. After uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, he, he said that if there were any increases in wages that workers would simply eat more and have more children driving wages right back down to subsistence. Uh, but of course, subsistence in Malthus's days was so much lower than it is today. Uh, even people on welfare are so much better off today than the King of England during Malthus's day. They've got automobiles, they've got TVs, they've got cell phones. So even the lowest sort here in the United States is broken far out of the Malthusian trap. Uh, then there's also this misconception that unions help labor, that labor laws help labor, that if it wasn't for unions, American workers would still be working 80 hours uh, under horrendous conditions. But unions don't help labor. Unions only help union members. And when they help union members, they actually hurt the rest of the labor force. And so under capitalism, the conditions for workers have improved remarkably 
in the United States, and we've, we've seen that as other countries have opened up into market-like economies, that workers in those economies are also much better off. Basically, you go from a subsistence, a bare subsistence in a non-market economy, such as we see in North Korea, such as we used to see in India and in China, uh, now for a large portion of their workforces has almost Western standards of living, and the number of people in extreme poverty um, has declined by 200, I think it's 200 million people in the last 10 years. So capitalism, not surprisingly, is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you.